every evening when the sun goes down Get with my party and I begin to cry I don't care what the people are thinking I'm not drunk, I'm just a drink I say I'm up Hello and welcome to A Toast to History, Romance and Mystery, where we chat about reading, drinking, geeking, and living the writer's life. I'm Kerrigan Byrne and I write historical fiction for St. Martin's Press and I'm also an indie published author. Uh, Today on the program we are toasting audiobooks and taking a peek into the sound booth. We're joined by the incomparable Derek Perkins, professional narrator extraordinaire. A little bit about Derek, he became a narrator in 2012, a move helped by his knowledge of three foreign languages, a facility with accents, and a lifelong love of the written and spoken word. In 2016, he won an Audi, which, if you didn't know, is like the Oscars of the audio profession, so for that's for his narration of The Highwayman by yours truly, I'm very proud to say, and has additionally been nominated for an Audi for his narration of Unruly Places by Alistair Bonet. Am I saying that correctly? Uh, Bonnet, but uh, it's fine. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> it sounded like it might might need to be a French pronunciation, but I was incorrect. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it sounded better that way, actually. <laughs> Bonnet. Okay. I, my apologies to Mr. Bonnet. Um, he, so you are a double finalist in 2014 and 2015 for the Society of Voice Arts and Sciences Award in two categories. And if that wasn't enough, Audiophile Magazine named you Best Voice in Biography and History in 2014 and 2015. Yes, and uh, because I'm British and completely immodest, I will add 2016 too. Oh, congratulations! <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome to the program. I'm so thrilled to have you. Thank you so much. I've been looking forward to doing this, and uh, I know it'll be a pleasure to talk with you. <laughs> well, this is, thank you. This is the most important question I'll probably ask you today. What are you toasting with? What's in your glass? <laughs> What I've got is, um, so I thought about this, actually, and uh, I thought, well, um, you know, here we are, we're talking about um, audiobooks, sure, but a lot of the books I've done have been romance, and of course, a lot of those romances have been Highland, Mm -hmm. uh, set in the Highlands, so I thought, I've got to have a whiskey, which I love anyway, so I am drinking the Macallan 12 years old single malt whiskey, and um, it's, it's great. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> that is really funny i'm now kind of i have a little bit of regret because i have i was just gifted a mccallan 15 and i oh. i thought oh i should do since he's he's done so many of my scottish historicals i should yeah. do the mccallans and um embarrassing situation why i didn't it was all the way on the bottom floor and i went through a really terrible leg workout yesterday and i can't squat down anymore <laughs> so i picked something from the top shelf <laughs> In my, well, in my pantry. You know, which... you know what? No, you, you, you have to learn to walk backwards down the stairs. <laughs> really? Yeah. It's so true. Yes, it was, it was the workout was two days ago. And today it's like one of those days where like the toilet is your nemesis. Where you're just like, I'm just not sitting or standing. I'm just going to uh-huh. pick a spot and stay there for the rest of the day. Uh, okay, well, well it... so I am drinking a Michael Collins uh, blended, which is kind of my go-to. It's smooth. It goes with everything. Good Irish good old Irish whiskey, you know? Yeah. Good on so, you. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so, um, oh, here's another question I have for you. Do you spell whiskey generally with a Y or an EY? That is a very good question. Um, whiskey with an EY, uh, I know I'm going to get this wrong, but I'm going to say it anyway. Whiskey with an EY, I believe is Scottish. Whiskey with a Y, K-Y, is Irish. It's the um, way the Irish spell it. I just knew you would know that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, actually, I didn't even mention your numerous audiophile earphones awards yet. So how many of those have you collected now? Like, you probably have to have built a couple of new shelves. Uh, yeah, an extension to the house, actually. <laughs> uh, no, I, you know what? I, funnily enough, I was just updating some stuff because I'm, I'm just about to redo my website completely. Mm-hmm. And uh, I found another one. So I now have 10. I thought I had nine, but I have 10. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm speaking flippantly, but I, I can't tell you how much um, that means to me. And, and not, honestly, not because I like, uh, you know, I, I think it makes me more important or, or whatever. I just, um, I just think that if someone has listened to what I've done and, and thinks it's worth awarding me that, then I'm, I'm just thrilled. I really am. But, uh, you know, uh, I truly, I, I don't do it for the awards that it's a wonderful, nice, 
add on uh, but i'm very happy to say yeah I, I have 10 currently that's wonderful you're you deserve every single one well deserved uh, so uh, <laughs> because of your extensive success and experience in the business you've recently published an audiobook narration manual it's uh, sort of a guide for anybody wanting to break into the business of audiobook production and narration can you tell us a little bit about what prompted you to do, you to do that and where we can find it yeah um well briefly it, it's um Something that came out of partly my own experience, because when I, uh, you know, I, I sort of, I tell everybody, I wish I could tell you that I changed my career because I did a pinpointed laser-like marketing exercise to determine where I should go next after I got laid off a few years ago, mm -hmm. but I didn't. I kind of found my way into it through, through um, a long and tortuous process. But um, the so so I can't kind of say what I, I I I mapped it out ahead of time. But having done it, having having found audiobooks, and then having um, you know gained experience and and learned how to set up a studio and started recording and so on, I, I the more I was talking to people at at uh, audiobook type events and and online and elsewhere, the more I was getting asked, well, you know, how do you get into it? And uh, so I thought, well maybe my experience might be helpful for people so i uh so i feel sort of like your trial and error might help other people have more less trials and also errors <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly because god knows i made enough errors for everybody um <laughs> but no you, you're right i mean it's it's designed to to try and minimize that hassle uh, for people reading it so, so they can learn from you know everything i had to go through and uh and if if that's an end result of the book, that's great. And if they do nothing else other than read the book and say, well, I, I don't know if doing it for money is for me, but I, I'd be happy to volunteer somewhere and do a good service that way, then I'd be thr <coughs> I'll be thrilled at that outcome too. Wonderful. So obviously you're a native of the UK. You have those uh, dulcet British tones, like you say. But uh, tell tell us where you're from originally and what brought you across the pond. Well, I'm from a, a small town in South London called Old Colesden, and um, just just by way of a quick, so I'm sure your readers, Kerrigan, will know the differences in the UK um, between the various nationalities. So, you know, you have Scottish, you have Northern Irish, you have Irish, you have um, English and Welsh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I was born in South London, but my mother was English and my father was Welsh. So, you know, it's like being in a household here where the, the mother's Canadian, the father's American, you know. So, you, right. you're not, what do you say you are? So, most of the time I say I'm British, but my Welsh heritage, and I spent a lot of time in Wales, is probably the stronger part of me. But, um, uh, so anyway, so yeah, South London is where I grew up. I uh, went to college in, in Wales and uh, lived there until I moved to the U.S. And I moved to the U.S. with a, with a job, obviously. And it was one of those deals where you have a three-year contract, you come over, and uh, my wife and two sons and myself had such a great time here at that time that we thought, well, we try and stay on. So, mm. uh, so we did, and that was 20-odd years ago. Wow, so that was... <laughs> At that time, and now times, they are a-changing, aren't they? <laughs> uh, yes, they are. So we, now we're thinking of going back. No, I, I'm, I'm only joking. <laughs> no, I'm, I couldn't say I blamed you. But I'm, I'm also, but I have to say, like, uh, I do a lot of, I spend a lot of time on the internet. Like, uh, uh, real estate sites in the UK have kind of become my late night pornography, where I just spend time looking at land and and different cottages and that kind of thing because i in my mind i'm i'm for sure the expat lifestyle is looking very very enticing let's say oh, I, I think you'd love it i do <laughs> I think you'd love it so tell us um you've been in the business now for five years uh can you walk us through a day in the life of an audiobook narrator with all of its glamour <laughs> <laughs> yeah right i say that because all of my glamour is sweatpants and laundry with, exactly. yeah so <laughs> you you uh, and your listeners do not want to know what i'm wearing most of the time but uh so i assure yeah, you they so, might <laughs> well maybe they might yeah <laughs> that'll be on a on a different session but uh, uh no you know i i i i gotta tell you i i live the life 
that I never dreamed I would live. I'm not pretending it's all roses, but uh, so here's here's how it works. Basically, I get up in the morning. I have uh, uh, I just kind of have some tea, and then I I come straight down to my my office. Not I don't get into the studio straight away, partly because my voice is not yet warmed up. So I, <clears throat> what I will do is is admin and and prep and you know for for books that need research I'll I'll do some of that, um, then I'll have my breakfast and by that time I've talked enough or I've done my warm ups to um, to be ready. So I go into the booth, and I spend uh, roughly I spend about an hour and a half at a time in the booth recording, and uh, that's uh, then I after that that's enough. For me, in one go, now I'll take a break. So I take a break mid mid morning. I take a break uh, lunchtime, and lunchtime is when I work out. By the way, so I take an extended break then. Mm -hmm. And here's the weird thing: even though I'm working for myself, and you know, knock on wood, things are going really well, I still agonize over taking an hour and a half at lunchtime to include a workout time. It's like, what's wrong with that? You know, no, I, I, I tend to have the same problem. It, it's when you have to be self-motivated, you're, you're less willing, I think, to stick it to the man because the man is you, <laughs> you know, yeah. and every moment that you take away from you, you're stealing from yourself. When I worked for the government, it was really easy for me to kind of futz around and strive for mediocrity during the day, you know. Uh, but, yeah, when you work for yourself, I, I know exactly what you mean. It's difficult to put the work down. It is. Mm -hmm. it, it is. And, and I don't know whether you find this too, but uh, I find that if I'm not careful, I don't take uh, – well, I do take enough vacation time, but it's like particularly for the holidays, mm -hmm. I just kind of find myself ignoring the holidays. And if I'm not careful, I've scheduled myself. And then my wife says to me, oh, I'm off on, you know, Labor Day or whatever. And I say, well, I've got to record a book. <laughs> so, so you're right. It, 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 is a, it gives you a different perspective on it completely. But in any case, that, that's my schedule, basically. And I repeat that in the afternoon. So I do two sessions, recording sessions in the afternoon, take a break mid-afternoon, and then that's it. I'm, I'm cooked. And you generally have the evening, too. Well, I'm sure your, your voice uh, just runs out. I mean, after so long, there's probably just... I definitely know that my brain does, you know, I feel like I, there's a certain point where I just kind of run out of words. I imagine your voice sort of just runs well, out you know, as well. It, and, and it's interesting you say that because, um, uh, again, knock on wood, but it's, it's not my voice that runs out, it's my brain. I just can't maintain the level of concentration and, and performance that I want to. And so, uh, you know, I, I just won't push it past that point. Um, I, um, I haven't had a problem with my voice so far, so I, I don't want to jinx it. But uh, and one of the reasons, I think, is because when you're speaking into a microphone, mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. a lot easier and you, you don't have to project anything like as much as you might if you're, you know, treading the boards, you're, you're, an, you're an actor on a stage uh, or whatever. Sure, sure. Yeah. Uh, so other than a, an intrinsically fantastic voice, what are some <laughs> other skills that uh, need to be established and developed in order to maintain, or in order to become a successful producer or audiobook narrator, in your opinion? Yeah, that's that's a big question. Um, I, I well, I guess you know, it's a, it's a bit like me saying to you, "Look, what's, how do you become a writer?" Right? There, there are <laughs> there are a lot of parts, right? Other than sure. you, you, you need that element of lunacy. I think in my profession, I can't speak for you, but you, you oh, absolutely. Well, um, I, I mean, you, you're almost, to me, when I listen to what you're, what you perform, and I say the word perform because it, it feels to me like you are an actor in a one man show. There are so yeah. many voices. And I, that's, I feel like that's the one thing I'm in awe of when it comes to audio acting is um, you are almost putting on a play th in which you are every character. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, that's one of the absolute delights of it. And I will, you know, you and I have talked a little bit about this, but I, I love the fact in your books, you have such a variety of characters. So sorry. And, and I can't, no, it's the opposite. I, honestly, I can't tell you how much pleasure that gives me. And, um, you know, the, you're right, it is a performance. The, the thing that's different about a uh, that the uh, you know audiobook narration to acting 
is simply the way in which you project yourself. The, the performance has, it's a weird thing to try and explain, but basically it's the performance in the booth has to be big, but it can't be big like it would be on a stage. So you've got to, you've got to limit the projection and you, you obviously can't fling your, your arms or your body around too much. <laughs> but you're, you're absolutely right. Oh, I do do that, by the way. From time to time, I'll fling my arm and then I'll tap something. So I have to stop it. Rever- but there you go. I mean, it's, it's a good sign, which, which means that I'm, I'm into the spirit of it. Um, but I, 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 would, I would answer your question too by saying that one of the things I always say to, to people I'm talking about uh, audiobook narration uh, a lot of the time people think that it's the same as voiceover mm-hmm. um, and I say well it's not at all so you know audiobooks to me are like marathons and you, you're not going to get anywhere if you sprint out of the gate uh, you, you rush it and uh, you set a pace that you just, you just can't uh, maintain so there's a lot of stamina that, that's involved in, in narrating an audiobook um, obviously, you need to be prepared to do your preparation. You, you've got to understand the book. You need to know where the where the author's coming from and all that good stuff. Um, but you, you've got to, and not everybody has this. You know, some great actors can't can't handle being, cl- uh, you know, closeted uh, like that for hours on end, um, as opposed to what they're used to doing. So the, there's kind of unique things about it, but. Well, that segues. Um, that segues into a really good question. Uh, I had a some Trudy from Brisbane emailed me, and she would like to know um, not just what your narration schedule is like, which I imagine means how long does it take from start to finish of an audiobook? Uh, yeah. Does it take you? And then uh, how much editing is involved at, in an audiobook versus voiceover narration? I mean, how you said you have to stop yourself if, if there's a little ping in the background, or maybe yeah. yeah how, how often do you have to do that? Oh, more often than I wish. <laughs> I, um, you know, you'd be amazed what what has to what stops you. So the obvious ones are you make a you make a mistake, and uh, then obviously you stop and you you re-record. Um, but I get uh, at certain points of the day, I get my stomach decides it's going to start gurgling, and then and that's a nightmare because the microphone will pick that up. The so, microphone will pick up some Oh it will. It will. Oh it's it's gosh. amazing. So, so you have that going on. Like I said, if I fling my arms around a bit too much and I ping a, a light or something. Um, the other thing that really uh, annoys the hell out of me is the desk that I have my monitor on. For, for some reason, it likes to just emit these almighty cracks from time to time. Uh-huh. So I'll be in the, right in the middle of it and then all of a sudden it's a crack and I have to stop and, and you know, re-record. Mm-hmm. But... Um, you know, as far as the, the length of time it takes, it all depends on the book, obviously. But it, for me to get a, a what we call a finished hour, so that's an hour of material that I can send to my publisher clients, um, it'll depending on the material, it'll probably take me an hour and a quarter to an hour and a half to get the hour of finished material. Um, so about half again the time it takes uh, to... Yeah. To record the actual book. Yeah, yeah, and you'll you'll hear narrators say they take three hours to get one or four hours to get one. So, uh, you know, I don't know what they do, and I may be lucky, but it, for me, it's like an hour and an hour and a half tops. Let's just say you're I, that good. So, well, I'll I'll take that and I'll drink to that. <laughs> Here comes the McCallum. Exactly, slantia. Um Okay, so uh, another fa- uh, question from a fan, Margaret from Pennsylvania, was wondering about uh, what your favorite and alternately your most challenging accents to narrate have been thus far. Yeah. Oh, God. You know, there have been a lot, but I, I, I will tell you this. All of yours. <laughs> um, actually, I'll come back to yours in a minute. But there are two that I... Um, uh, no, actually, there's one that, that I, I really enjoy doing, and it's... Um, it's a series, a thriller series, by an author called Robert Goddard. Mm-hmm. And um, his main character is called James Maxted. And he's this guy who's got a slight Scottish accent because of his heritage and having lived in Scotland for a little bit of time. But he's, he's mainly kind of English. Um, but he's got a, a bit of a Scottish twang. But he's a very cool character. And he's not, he's not a James Bond type um, operator. 
but he's he's just a, a cool dude, cool yeah. character, someone I really like. He's got a lot of lot to him, you know. Yeah. Um, so that was a, a lot of fun to voice. But I will say honestly, coming back to yours, <laughs> well, one of the ones I loved was the Hunter, right, Christopher Argent. Oh yes, and it was so different for two reasons. One is the way I chose to do it was to make the voice a little bit a um, little bit huskier than I, I would normally do and a little bit sort of monotone in a way. Yes. But he had this whole dark side to him, mm-hmm. which um, which was great for me to, to, to play with and try to get that sound coming through in the voice. So I, I really liked that. And then there was the other one in, in that springs to mind is Jock, which was, I think, in The Highwayman, wasn't it? Um, was it Jock? He was a Scotsman. <laughs> <It> was... <laughs> I should have I should have looked this up. Oh, you're week. so fine. But uh, in any case, he, I, I decided to do him as like a gruff, gruff old Scots guy, and I just I don't know. Um, you wrote him. He was such a lot of fun. It yes, was great. he was a lot. Murdoch. That's what I think. Murdoch. Think. Thank yes, you. Murdoch. Stop. Yes, I was like, no, you're you're totally right. I think he has a, a short first name. It might be Jack Murdoch. I think, but he's right. yeah. I loved the way uh, I loved the way you voiced both Argent particularly because I had worries about that because I every in my mind I did he was so kind of monotone he was very he had a flat kind of a flat affect yeah and um I I, I kind of modeled him after I don't you probably don't watch this but uh, Dexter who was a serial killer on Showtime okay. and um he kind of had the same uh, the same issue where he's sort of a somewhat high functioning sociopath that doesn't really kind of uh, made so by trauma and he doesn't really understand the emotions of other people and so he sort of fails to he tries to emulate them and fails often and I feel like you yeah. pulled that off just swimmingly so thank you Good. for that glad to hear it. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> I have to say um, and I know this was you know uh, something. I was going to ask you later, but um, I have to say my favorite character of mine that you voiced, I think just because I felt bad for making you try was, and I forget, I forget his name, but he's the gay best friend in A Righteous Kill. (laughs) And I thought to myself, I remember writing this and I remember, I remember you saying, yeah, I'd, I'd be, I'd be willing to do that. And I'm like, okay. And I, and I remember thinking the moment like we kind of signed that contract thinking like oh no he's going to have to i don't know how derek of the like husky british voice is going to pull off you know this very effeminate like very kind of sparkly fabulous man and you did such an amazing job and it's still one of my favorite moments my favorite audio moments of yours so oh i'm so glad i'm so glad i yes i'd forgotten that one that, yeah. that was great yeah yes and again I'm sorry for all of the times I tried to make you do Boston accents or something. No, don't, crazy. don't. <laughs> yeah, the Boston, actually the Boston accent, yes. <laughs> if I never have to do another one of them, I'd be very happy, but uh, I will keep sorry. trying. <laughs> so, um, let me think. So how many, how many different genres then, other than romance? Because you've, you've, you've kind of... Uh, I, I want to say become just this superstar in the romance and the, and especially the Scottish historical romance genre. But you uh, narrate over many genres. So how how many would you say that that is? Um, depending on how you count it, basically it's it's about eight. Um, so uh, it, you know it goes from from romance. Obviously, there's there's history, there's mystery, there's fantasy. There's uh, biography, and then there's sort of generic fiction and non-fiction. And there, I also do um, f- uh, philosophy slash religion, too. So I, I, I really go across quite a broad spectrum, and, and as I say, non-fiction as well as fiction. Um, but you're right, I've, I've done, uh, what have I done, about 30, 30 romance books, um, which isn't actually the most in any genre, but um, uh, it's it's one that I do seem to have found a little bit of a niche in, or niche, as we Brits would say. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, and I, I do I do enjoy doing uh, doing the romance uh, books. I must I must admit. So you probably learn. I mean, just by the contracts that you sign. Here's the question I have for you: Do you 
get to kind of go out and look for something that you would enjoy? Or does a, a production company or an audio company bring the books to you for auditions? How does that exactly work? Yeah, exactly the latter. Um, they will come to me and uh, and say, we have this book. And I would say about 80% of the 90% of the time, maybe they'll say, right, if you could if you want to do it and you can meet the schedule, it's yours. Uh, 10, 15 percent of the time, they'll say we would like you to be considered for this, but we have to submit you to be approved. And uh, uh, I would say, I don't know, probably 50 50 then. You know, I, I, I will be approved for 50 percent and the others I won't be. So um, but but no, I basically have no choice in it. I did very quickly. Um, uh, you're, are you familiar? I hope hopefully people listening to will be familiar with the author Bill Bryson. I've heard uh, his name, but remind okay. anybody who hasn't what uh, what he writes. Well, in brief, Bill Bryson is a, a, a basically a writer of travel books mainly, mm -hmm. and he's a, he's an American who married a British nurse, which is a very great parallel to me. Then that I married a British nurse, <laughs> and uh, he now lives in the UK. He's obviously. U.S. citizen originally. He does these travel books, which are just supremely funny, but also very well, well written. And he just brought out a new one. And it was the only time since I've been doing this professionally that I actually uh, found out who his agent was, wrote to them, and they passed on my information to him. And I basically made a groveling pitch <laughs> to narrate his latest book, which was all about Britain. Right. And uh, he was very generous and very gracious and said he'd pass my information on. And then the publisher didn't choose me. So now, I've boy now I'm boycotting all of his books forevermore. <laughs> That's so sad. <laughs> I know. I'm, I'm about to give up my life and go and grovel and see if any, you know, if I can take his job. <laughs> yeah, really, really. Being yeah. a travel writer. I've, I've lately been addicted to this uh, show. It's on the HGTV channel. It's House Hunters International, which is so mm. silly because every time I bring that up, people tell me my grandmother watches it. <laughs> but it, <laughs> what it really is is it's it's people in foreign countries buying houses, and it's yeah, so I've interesting. Seen it. yeah. yeah, it's so interesting to me to just see kind of the differences in currency and in what's available, you know, and and kind of how people expats especially kind of live. Yeah, over yeah. in other parts of the world and. Um, a great deal of them tend to be travel writers. And I think to myself, like, I am in the wrong profession. <laughs> like, I need to be going and buying a flat somewhere on the Mediterranean because I need to I be close enough to travel write about something. So Mr. Bill has my job. My In my next <laughs> life, I'm coming back as that guy. <laughs> I, you know what? I'm going to email him as soon as we finish. And I'm going to let him know he's got to get into romance writing because I'm ready to take his place. <laughs> That's right. I yeah. think you'd be great at it, actually. Yeah, I really do. you. I feel. <laughs> So um, uh, I was just going to ask about how much time do you yourself listen spend listening to audiobooks as opposed to to reading the written word? Well, um, not as much as I'd like is the, is the is the short answer. I what I do I do listen to audiobooks uh, um, you know regularly, but it tends to be I've got to be driving somewhere um, or, or something like that. Otherwise, I just don't have the time. And in the evenings, I find that I just, um, this, the only slightly sad part of what I'm doing now is that by the evening time, I really kind of don't even want to read anymore. Mm -hmm. So I, I find myself now more and more looking at videos in the evening or watching movies or whatever, uh, not even audiobooks. I, you know, it's like my brain is full on that stuff. That's so. what I was, yeah, that's kind of what I was going to ask next is I, as an author, once since becoming an author, I really find that I've, I read a great deal less than I used to. You know, I used to be such yeah. a bibliophile, and that's why I think most authors become authors. But then once it becomes your job, once it becomes work, yeah. Um, you know, I often turn to audiobooks if there's a book I really want to read because I'm just so tired of looking at words by the end of the day. Yeah. Or um, I do a lot of, like, I watch the movie. And so a lot of people will ask me, like, oh, well, did you read this book? It's the new big thing. And I'll be like, well, I watched the movie. Does that count? <laughs> <laughs> you know? Which I know it doesn't count. I know it doesn't. So I do go and get the audiobook, and then I try to listen to it, you know, when I'm cleaning the house or yeah. driving, you know, or that kind of thing. So do you, do you find... 
it just difficult to get lost in the story? Um, you know, that, that's a really good question because uh, what I find is when I'm listening to an audio book, as long as the voice of the narrator is fine, um, th then, uh, yeah, I get lost in it and that's it. That's great. I'm good to go. I don't tend to, don't tend to think too much about how they're reading it and, you know, whether I think it's good, bad or indifferent. Um, and, uh, but the weird thing is that when I'm reading now for pleasure, uh, and I do this whether it's magazine articles, newspapers or books or whatever, and it drives me nuts, is a lot of the time I'm hearing in my brain that other voice and it's it's trying to work out how I would rec do that as if I was recording it, you know, and I feel like saying, shut up, I want to just read this and enjoy it, <laughs> and I can't switch it off. Don't so it's, it's, work. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's, it's a weird thing. So, yeah, I can, I can understand your... Um, situation totally uh, yes yeah I, I don't mean to i don't mean to edit other people's work but no. i'm either editing thinking to myself well i would never get away with that in a book or i'm thinking you know how do you structure a sentence like that and like if i rub it on me will it you know can i <laughs> like by osmosis can i take this <laughs> you know like it's, exactly. like it's one way or the other yeah i just don't it's really difficult i think it's a, it takes a lot of different uh, writing, I think it's fiction. Honestly, I've spent my time these days reading a lot of nonfiction because right. I don't do that with research See? or with biographies and nonfiction, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, right, right. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so that's that's your escape uh, hatch, as it were. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, um, I guess that's that's a small price to pay for what we enjoy doing, though, right? Yes very much we are living the dream well Derek yes. it's been about a half an hour so it's been an absolute pleasure having you on with us today uh, before I go I want to ask you to let us know where we can find you online um, and if there are any upcoming releases or events uh, where we can see and or hear from you yes um, uh, I'm online on the web at the Derek Perkins .com. Um, my Twitter handle is at Derek Perkins, but that, with a C, not a K, because I couldn't get the K. And uh, Facebook is at Derek Perkins Audiobook Narrator. Um, and I am, um, yeah, I, I've just finished uh, quite a neat series of romance novels, actually, by Julia London. Um, and, uh, oh, she's uh, incredible. I enjoyed, yeah, I enjoyed doing those. It's uh, uh hard-hearted highlander is is the latest last one i did and then um <laughs> yeah. jealous. i'm jealous of her title that's a good that's a good one and then, i am a fan of the alliteration so yeah yeah hard-hearted yeah say say that three times after you've had too many michael collins is right? i don't think i can and like i said I, I poured myself two fingers and um i'm going to need a refill so there goes out go out the window goes the the moderation Oh, well. <laughs> there we go. The <laughs> next one should be really good. Um, yeah, and then and then uh, just quickly, I, um, I I've also done a couple by Isabel Cooper recently, mm -hmm. and she's got this. It's a bit like the zombie thing, I guess, but she's got this Highland Dragon genre subgenre thing going, where the hero is not only you know is he a, is he uh, a brawny Scottish debonair Highlander. But he is also a dragon, uh -huh. yes. and, and so it's a really different twist on it. And they were, they were think, quite. I think we can thank Game of Thrones for this kind of rise in the dragon. Y yeah, the dragon right. right. Subgenres. Those are those are a lot of fun. Those mythologies can be yeah. interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. so you're going to make a couple of personal appearances as well. Is that right? I, I am. I'm. Uh, I was invited to the Virginia Festival of the Book in Charlottesville. That's uh, if if anybody happens to be in the area, I would be delighted to see you. It's on uh, March twenty fifth, uh, which is a Saturday, at twelve o'clock. And um, yeah, I'm on a panel there, and we're all guys, and we're all talking about um, uh, you know voicing uh, romance works and um, and and you know creating the performances and 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 so on so i'm really looking forward to that I think be, that would be like, any audiophile's dream just to uh, just you know a cluster i don't even know what, it's like i don't know what you would call it a a gathering of narrators like a you know you have a murder of crows and a 
yeah. in a parliament of ravens. <laughs> What's it? That's right, there? a collective noun. A, yeah, a, I don't know. A timbre of. Uh, <laughs> oh, I like that. A timbre of narrators <laughs> of your favorite historical. <laughs> or not even historical, but romance narrators. That would just yeah. be, I might fly across the country just to see <laughs> slash listen to that. So, well, that's beautiful. And what's the date on that again? I'm sorry. Uh, March 25th, Saturday, March 25th. Perfect. Yeah. Well, uh, beautiful. Uh, really quick, next week on A Toast to History, Romance and Mystery, we will be toasting the agents with wish list with Christine Whitholm from Book Sense Literary Agency. We will be discussing just what happens behind the agent's desk, her turn-ons and turn-offs literary, of course, and publishing predictions uh, for the next few years. So uh, go ahead and join us for that. I'm Kerrigan Byrne, and until next time, uh, raise your glass to learning something new and creating something truly great. Slatcha and to your health. Another round, another round.